Thank you to the, uh, to the moderators for, and for Dr. Kendrick for allowing me to go first. Uh, and I'm going to scoot out at the very end. I've got a flight to catch. So when I originally was planning this talk and looking at the order, it's supposed to be Mike Kendrick talking about laparoscopic resections in the head of the pancreas and then me talking about robotics. So there'll be a few, uh, a few nods in that direction here. Because how do you follow Mike Kendrick? Well, you alter the order and you go first and then you let Mike Kendrick follow you. <laughs> Um, so here are my disclosures. My spouse, who's a urologist, is a consultant for Coloplast and Richard Wolf and Olympus. Um, he does things through um, a singular hole, so I don't think there's much conflict of interest. I really, really, really like laparoscopic surgery, so this talk is a little bit um, fun for me. And I am not here to debate the merits or lack thereof of robotic Whipple, so you can stand down. Um, this is not another one of those talks about the robotic advantages that you've heard before. We all know that we, there's enhanced visualization, there's wristed motion, there's decreased surgeon fatigue, and there's dual console training. You are aware of those things. I will, I will not belabor those points, and we can argue all day about whether or not those make a difference. Um, but what we can see is that we know that the robot is getting used increasingly in the absence of data. So this is actually from a paper that came out of our group. Um, we used 2011 NIS data as our baseline, and you can see that, that robotic this is for surgical oncology specifically, robotic resections of cancer are increasing dramatically in the United States, and, and that's not going to change. Now, I put a little asterisk there, because the same thing happened with laparoscopy. If you recall, during the advent of laparoscopic surgery, there still hasn't been a randomized controlled trial showing that lap coli is better, right? So this is going to continue to happen, and whether we like it or not. So we need to understand what the data is and when we can employ this modality for our patients to benefit them. Um, here's another just breakdown of increased robotic use over time by case type. And the, the, you can see in the gold there is pancreas. And I would imagine that looking at the data from 2014 until now would be an even bigger skyrocket, especially with the advent of the XI. Um, geographically, this is, these were the trends that we saw, uh, pardon some of those uh, fonts got translated poorly, but the, um, the advent and the, the adoption um, kind of spread from northeast to midwest, and we're catching on southeast to west. And this, again, was from 2010 to 2014, so we may see some different numbers now. Uh, but again, dramatic increases over just a few years of this modality permeating our practice with very little data and, and sometimes training proffered only by a company. Pardon? There we go. Um, and so for a minimally invasive pancreas surgery, of course, Tim Pollack has had something to say about this. So um, from 2002 to 2012, we look at uh, 26,000 pancreatic resections, and, um, and we look at the differences between open and, um, and MIS resection. Now, here is all comers, all pancreas resections, and these are just distal. So you can notice that really that, that additional 1%, I think, in this period of time was entirely driven by, by Dr. Kendrick. Um, I think he was the person uh, doing doing that extra 1%. Um, but as you can see, these patients have fewer complications, lower mortality, decreased length of stay, and, and similar rates of non-routine discharge. And again, yes, of course, these patients were highly selected, but we know that this costs less. We know that the patients can have at least one day more of functional recovery, according to the Dutch. And so this is something that we really should be thinking about for our patients. Now, everyone keeps saying there's no data, lab versus robot. Well, there's starting to be some data. So this is another study out of our group uh, where we took the NCDB and looked at oncologic outcomes um, after robotic-assisted versus lap distal pank. And, and no surprise, it's the same. So um, there were 704 distal panks um, for pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma in the NCDB from 2010 to 2013. And 86% of them were lap and 14% of them were robot. And again, I think the numbers in the last five years would be dramatically different with the XI. Um, there's no difference in margin positive rate, lymph nodes examined, length of stay, time to chemo, or readmission. And now I'll draw these, your attention to these numbers. These numbers are so helpful. For those of you who are about to be in junior practice, um, it's always nice to, to look back at these large-scale data when you're, when you're feeling terrible about yourself, because you don't remember these things happening in residency with this level of frequency. <laughs> but then once you get out, you really want to know, like, how often does this really happen? So margin positive rate, and again, you can argue leads versus other techniques, because the margin positive rate is probably a little higher than that if you're really looking looking closely. Um, lymph nodes examined, 12 versus 11. I think that's a reasonable uh, measure of quality. Length of stay, I was surprised by for minimally invasive um, cases, but yeah, for cancer especially, I think that that's a reasonable time. And then obviously time to chemo being very important. And then the, the big 
push here and the big reason why I think a lot of people are, are able to make the jump to minimally invasive from open to robot is, is, is that, again, it, it does more closely mirror what you're doing in, with an open procedure with the wristed motion. So in this study, we found that there were significantly more conversions to open, 27% in the laparoscopic group versus 10% in the robotic group. And anybody can tell you if, you, if you were not raised laparoscopically, that is not an intuitive thing to do. Um, but it is, for lack, and I'm not trying to do a pun, and I, I don't love the company, but, but it isn't more an intuitive thing to do to go from open to robotic. And there have been studies in the urologic literature to support that. Now, this is a very interesting graph. And what, what we did here is we took um, the, the volume of, of pancreas resections and separated them into uh, two quintiles, looking at the number. So this is the total number of minimally invasive pancreas resections in the NCDB. And we separated them into different hospitals. So, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, more than 50% of the Whipples are being done at community hospitals. Well, a, a large proportion of these uh, pancreas resections that are minimally invasive are being done at hospitals that do one to three and four to eight every year. And, and this, this should be upsetting to us, right? Because we really do need these things to be centralized. If you are going to grow a minimally invasive pancreas program, you should not be doing it in a hospital that is doing one pancreas resection a year. This is not a safe thing for your patients. Um, so, and then you can get into the argument, well, how do you become a high volume center if you're not seeing these things? I don't know how to answer that, but I do know that it's not safe for your patients if you're doing less than, you know, eight pancreas resections a year at that institution. Um, when we look at uh, increasing robot and lap use over time, again, um, this is just another graphical representation of that. We are seeing increasing uses of MIS in the field, um, but again, that really needs to be not just playing around that you, ha you know, happen to do MIS surgery for other things and, well, I try my hand at the pancreas instead of referring this patient. Um, let's talk about evidence for robotic superiority. So this paper came out in Annals of Surgery in 2013, made a big old stink. Um, uh, so Herb Zay and his friends at, at Pittsburgh, who's now, he's now at UT Southwestern, looked at their first ro 30 robotic distal pancs versus 94 consecutive historical laparoscopic pancreatectomy cases that happened prior to them converting to using the robot. They had zero robotic conversions versus 16% lap. Uh, later on, they updated their robotic experience and they converted two out of 80 times. They had decreased risk of excessive blood loss and oncologic outcomes, they said they were able to retrieve more nodes with the robot. They had higher rates of margin negative resection and improved lymph node yield. Now, there has been a lot of talk about this, and they had like no fewer than four replies published in annals, um, in addition to a lot of, uh, I'm sure, a lot of personal communications. Um, but this study was full of selection bias, um, they, 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 and they admittedly will say this in the, for MIS patients. So their learning curve for LAP had already been completed, and there was a lack of operative detail, not really saying where the location of the tumor was for these particular cases. Now, they would argue that, um, that when they were doing their laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy, that they had already overcome this, that they didn't really start that until they felt comfortable laparoscopically. Um, so their argument is, well, actually, you know, we did control for, for many of these things. When we look at more evidence, so here's some more data that you can have in mind instead of telling everybody there's no data. When we look at robot versus distal, so there was a prospective non-randomized trial, lap versus robot distal out of Bossy's group in Verona. Uh, they went from 2011 to 2014. Um, they had 22 robotic cases, 21 lap, and they noted no difference in nodes, resection, their conversion rate, uh, and length of stay. There's also been a meta-analysis that incorporated nine studies and 637 patients, um, 20, 246 robot cases, 391 lap. The robot took 30 minutes of extra operative time, which is about how much it takes to dock and undock a robot, um, despite what we all think we can do faster. And the conversion rate, though, as usual, was higher in the laparoscopic group, 20 versus 9%. Now, this was not significant, but it was very small numbers. So when we look at robotic learning curve, 20 and 40 cases, and I think that Dr. Kendrick will tell us that, that the, the laparoscopic Whipple curve a priori, if you're not trained to do this, is probably a little bit higher than the, these numbers. Um, maybe, maybe not in his hands, but certainly might be in mine. Um, and so you go, for the first 20 cases, you start to see a plateau with your operative time, and then after 40 cases, um, this is out of the Herb Zay's group, again, in, in their first 100, you really start to see um, decreased variation in your OR times. And the thing I want you to pay attention to is the these numbers here. You need to know when your max is going to be. When you're starting a robotic pancreas program, you need to know when are you going to stop if you're not progressing. It is not safe to, to commit the patient to an eight-hour robotic pancreas surgery that could be two hours open. You just, that's not, it's not the right thing to do. Um, learning curve and time limits. Um, so, 
the, there's a group out of uh, Taipei that looked at this. At, they did robotic whipples after mastering the distal pink. They had 37 cases for robotic. That was their learning curve for the distal. And then after that, they said their learning curve for the robotic whipple was only 20 minutes. Um, so it, they, and they had decreased EBL and OR time in both of the late groups after this cutoff. So again, you want to set time when you're starting your program, set time limits with yourself for different portions of the operation. If you're stuck, consider working at working elsewhere, call for help, or convert to laparoscopic if you're more comfortable that way or open. Um, we just heard a whole long talk about ergonomics, so I won't belabor this point, but there have been EMG studies looking at laparoscopic versus robotic, and they do find um, increased activation of biceps, triceps, deltoids, um, and traps in the, in the, um, in the laparoscopic group, and this, but this does become less relevant with increased experience, and there have been, I should note that there have been other groups that have shown increased trapezius ac activation in robotics um, as opposed to others. But in general, I, I mean, we've all operated after a long day. I feel much better after a robotic day than I do after a long laparoscopic day, particularly for morbidly obese patients. Now, what about cost? Um, so I, I'm not going to belabor these points because we all know the robot costs more. Um, and sometimes you can lose money on it if you're not appropriately um, thinking about it. But basically, some of the bigger things, if you look at amortized costs of the cost of the robotic upkeep, so if you're not just looking at the case-by-case -case difference, so case-by-case -case difference with hospital stay, we're usually looking at somewhere around the order of about 1000 bucks more, um, or 6% of procedure costs. But this is a study out of 2010, so I imagine it's a little different now. And this was a urologic study. But they looked at, per case, the uh, additional cost was $3,200 when you think about also the amount of money it takes to keep the robot up every year. Um, so then there was another group, again, this is a little bit of an older study, um, but looking at shorter hospital stay with robotic um, distal paint costs, and they save about two grand, but this is not versus laparoscopic. Um, and then higher spleen preservation rates, you can de debate that with adenal sati on your own time. Um, so sample scan, so I just wanted to show you an example of some of the things that we can do with the robot and not hurt afterwards. So this is adenocarcinoma uh, of the pancreas invading the tail of the spleen. This is actually a very odd metastatic uterine cancer. But nevertheless, the patient had a BMI of 43. Um, I put her in a supine position. I put a jelly roll under her left arm. We flexed the bed like you would do for a nephrectomy. And, and, and we put our ports, this is our normal, um, this is the port system I was raised with, uh, with camera in the middle, vessel sealer, uh, big assist port so you can extract the specimen. I, I was raised with an assistant port here. Um, for, for morbidly obese people, I actually really enjoy varicing in Palmer's Point and putting an assist port there because it really helps um, be on top of things uh, with the sucker. And you, you do have to reach around the robotic arm and encourage your fellow not to uh, try and hurt you. Um, but it's very helpful. And for all morbidly obese patients, you want to move everything up at least two finger breadths. Um, so this is just showing a few pictures, that, um, and mostly I just want to emphasize to you that when you're new uh, in practice and you have trainees, it's very helpful to be at the bedside and with them um, at the console because you can really set this up. I am setting up this visualization. You can see the pancreas nicely. This is my hand. My other hand is off screen, uh, pulling the momentum down so that, the, that they can see. And this is a beautiful, uh, we can see the splenic artery very clearly along its course. Uh, again, I have control right here, so she's about to fire a stapler uh, on this artery, and if she and if it misfires, I've got control right there. Uh, splenic flexion mobilization. Again, I'm off camera holding traction for 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 visualization. Off camera holding traction there. Uh, we use seam guard. We're transecting the pancreas with laparoscopic, and then I do place the drain. We do everything with the robot dock because once you undock the robot, that's your foggy view. That's not quite as fun. Um, so a word on quick uh, on robotic ports. Don't forget to burp and look for the dome upon insufflation when you're above the belly button. And um, the last thing I would say is if the BMI is great, like in a good way, close that eight. So we've had several at our institution, especially with the lateral ports after long cases, they can get port site hernias there. So if, if the rule of thumb I tell the, the, the trainees is if you are looking down at the skin and you can see the fascia, you know how sometimes you're just like looking at the fascia, close it because you're going you're gonna to see it later um, if, you don't, if you don't take care of it. Um, and then this is my trainee who was doing that case that you showed the pictures. Her name's Camille Stewart. She's a first-year surgeon fellow. She's looking for a job. She's excellent. Um, she's abdominal badassery. If you need, if you would like her contact information, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, so advantage for having trainees in the operating room. So with laparoscopic, you've got your two hands holding and you are tied up, right? You can't really, you know, you can't really do much besides letting them, letting them do things. If you're doing a two attending case or if you're there at the bedside, you can do things. When you have three arms that you've got the trainees do, okay, hold the third arm, fix it. Now you've got your two arms 
now I have room to move around with at least one arm that, that is kind of extra. So the trainees get to do the case, everybody can see, you're ergonomically better, and there's no need for multiple position changes. Oh, now I've got to move from between the legs to over, and we've got this other port, and let's move the camera out this way. It's, it's, I find that there's much fewer transitions in our practice now. And the final warning, I wanted a nod to, to, Mr., to Dr. Mayo there in, in honor of Dr. Kendrick. Um, the best interest of the patient is truly the only interest to be considered. So when you are rolling out a minimally invasive pancreas program, w whatever it is, whatever is best in your hands is what you should be doing. If you're comfortable lap, do it lap. If you're comfortable robotic, do it robotic. But as you're growing your program, you need to be honest with your patients. Disclose your experience. All of the Pittsburgh patients knew what number patient they were. They knew they were patient number one, robotic Whipple. Patient number four, robotic Whipple. Um, and check out the 2014 SAGES guidelines on innovation that were authored by Vivian Strong. Um, these are some really amazing um, ways to help yourself stay ethical as you're trying to roll out new technologies in your hospital, which I think is extremely important. Engage experienced colleagues, proctors, and partners. In conclusion, robotic pancreas surgery is safe uh, and non-inferior to laparoscopic surgery. Robotic surgery costs more, but conversion to open can sometimes should generally cost more than robotic surgery, and further data is needed to justify the ubiquitous attempts at robotic whipples that are occurring presently. Thank you, and I'll take any questions. Excellent. Thank you.